Now you may be seated. Very few times do I put the words uh, theologian and humorist together, uh, but there's a theologian who's also a humorist named Father James Martin. He tells the story of little Tommy in, in Sunday school uh, one Sunday morning with, with the teacher, and the teacher looked at him and, and said, Tommy, who knocked over the walls around Jericho? Tommy looked at her, and his eyes got bigger, and he said, well, well, I didn't do it. Well, this, this concerned the teacher, and she decided to go to Tommy's mother and explain what, what happened. And the mother looked at the teacher and said, well, if, if Tommy said he didn't do it, he didn't do it. Well, it was really concerned, the teacher. And she looked across the room and saw Tommy's dad and walked over to him and explained what happened. And, and finally, he, he stopped her and said, look, we don't want any trouble, ma'am. Just how much is it going to cost to rebuild this wall? You know, that would be a great story if, if it weren't true. <laughs> but it's not actually true. I don't think it actually happened. But, but it, it's a reflection of... of much more common occurrence in, in our world today. Today we're, we're wrapping up uh, the sermon series on, on hope. Ecclesiastes 3 says that there is a, a time for every purpose under heaven. And although it doesn't specifically mention hope, I think when you put all these together, there is a time for hope. There is a time for every purpose under heaven, including for Christians, hope. We've heard of powerful stories time and again over the last several weeks, including from Pat Williams Boyd at our piano this morning. Great stories of hope. We can move forward, as Christian people, we can move forward with hope and purpose as we serve a God who moves powerfully through his people. And that's, that's the why of, of hope. Remember that? Our hope is in the power of God working through the hearts of people. This is where we see hope. And our hope begins with the Easter story. The story of the resurrection. Not just that, that the story of Jesus' resurrection, the story of the empty tomb. We don't just hear it and celebrate it on Easter, but we actually celebrate it and remember it every Sunday because we understand that the story of the resurrection is not just the story but it's 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 real it actually happened and so hope we find the definition of hope is this the constant confident assured expectation that God will see us through every circumstance until we are standing before him in heaven in his latest book, Hope in Times of Fear, of Fear, Tim Keller points out that the resurrection means two things for us as Christ followers. Number one is hope in the future. But also, secondly, of, of what he calls a great reversal. This reversal changes every aspect of human life. The resurrection, the source of our hope, comes from the cross. And because of this, we know that Jesus did not save us in spite of his weakness. But Jesus saves us through his weakness. Think about this. Our Christian hope is made manifest through weakness. Christian hope Christian strength is the result of weakness. You know, some days it's, it's hard uh, for me. I, I see a lot of emails, a lot of headlines that come across my, my computer screen. And, and they're not all hopeful. One writer uh, says this, sums up the, the state of the church in America with, with two words, a mess. I don't like that either. People are, are 
not coming back to church in in droves post-pandemic. Entire denominations are being tarnished by dysfunctional leadership and racism and tolerating sexual abuse. The central theme of Ephesians 5 compares the union of husband and wife to that of Christ and the church. Ephesians 5 begins by calling on Christians to imitate God and Christ who gave himself up with love. Now, I I was reading earlier this week, Carrie Newhoff actually wrote an article uh, that says that gave pastors permission to blame everything on the pandemic. Something bad happens if you have a bad day or if things aren't going well, just, okay, just blame it on the pandemic. That's that's convenient, but it doesn't work in, in all circumstances because it's easy to blame it on the pandemic, but the truth is, and when I say church, I'm not talking about really First United Methodist Church. I, we face our challenges, but Big C Church, the United Methodist Church, the church faces challenges. Even pre-COVID, The reality is that that the church, Big C Church, had its challenges and issues 16 months ago. And, And although the pandemic has exposed some of our problems, it's also presented wonderful opportunities, new opportunities. 16 months ago, we we had to shift very quickly. We had to pivot very quickly. We one of our problems was exposed. We, we had to start putting our services out online. We weren't ready for that. We weren't equipped for that. We went from one Sunday meeting in person and, and after that service gathering as leaders and saying, we, I guess we need to shut down. And the next Sunday, Christopher Ebert's here on a platform with a, a, a broken tripod holding up a, a huge camera He almost put his shoulder out of socket. He was laughing about that later. But but we said, well, it's okay. It's just for, remember this, it's just for a few weeks. But we we had to learn on the the fly. And I I am so thankful, not just for people in the church, but for for a wonderful, amazing staff who who pivoted and and connected and, and helped people connect. It was a process. Some weeks went well, sometimes it, it, it didn't go very well. Mark Adams has been serving the last few years as, as our, our youth pastor and as our praise team leader. Mark, come on up. We, we decided to do this live rather than, than on video this morning. But he's been working diligently on, on not just the, the quality, but, but the content of our, of our online worship. Uh, he, he, Mark was instrumental, actually, he did. He secured a grant through the Center for Congregations uh, for our online uh, equipment and software, and uh, he's been working on that uh, through a movement of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. A couple people, uh, it was an answer to prayer, said, came to me and said, what do we need to do? Uh, well, we needed funds, and they were generous in, in providing uh, seed money uh, for, for this ministry. Uh, and so our online presence grew, uh, and we see it growing. And, and Mark's been working on that. Um, and, and I was telling Mark on uh, one morning, this goes back several months ago, but it was just pressed upon me that we really need to develop this, this online ministry uh, and take it to the next level. There's always, you know, we were... Uh, doing this online and live streaming, but then the next question, well, what's next? There's always new things to do. And so I was really, it was just pressed upon me that we, we need to focus on this, and, and because of the gift that we have in somebody like Mark Adams, he, he was the guy to, to lead this. And I'll, I'll let you take it from there. Because uh, our stories intersect here. Yeah, I, I was dealing with something similar in thinking, you know, we're not really doing what we're supposed to do. No offense to you, but we were only reaching you at that time. And uh, I believe that Jesus told us to reach those not in the church. And so 
I just started feeling like God was leading us to start something that would reach beyond the walls of the church. Uh, but I know that as, as a pastor, sometimes it's annoying when people come to you and say, I believe that God wants us to do this. Go for it. <laughs> and so I wasn't going to do that to him. So I knew if I talked to him, this may become my thing. And so I'm in my office one morning trying to figure out how am I going to tell him this because it's going to take a substantial amount of time. And that's going to interfere with some of the things that I do. And he came into my office, closed the door behind him, and I immediately went, uh-oh. <laughs> and started thinking, where do I have my resume stored? And um, he, he just said, I, I feel like we need to do better online. We need to reach people in a different way, and I feel like you're the one to do it. Um, what do you think about that? And I was like, whoa, this is, I, I believe this is a God thing because this is kind of how I was feeling led. Uh, so that was that was pretty cool. And and you've this is been, cozy, by the way. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, you've been doing a lot of reading uh, and study and and sharing that not just with me but with staff uh, and and about some alarming things going on in our culture in America. So what have you been reading? What can you share about uh, the relationship of of Jesus uh, with with our nation today? What's what's going on? Well, for years, experts like Kerry Newhoff have been saying that the United States was moving into a post-Christian society, that it was coming, that it was down the road, but that the day would come where, where we would move from being a Christian nation to be a post-Christian nation. And it looks like the pandemic has sped up this process to where we're now actually in that time. I've been reading about that for, for years, but for everybody's benefit, what exactly is a, a post-Christian society? Well, here's the definition. Post-Christian is defined as the loss of the preeminence or primacy of the Christian worldview in places where Christianity previously flourished. This is especially true in Western culture, uh, the U.S. specifically. So in other words, the United States, I think we can agree, was founded on biblical principles. There were 55 delegates who wrote the first constitution, and 52 of them were active members of their church. So being a Christian nation was important to them, and for over 200 years, we have been known as a Christian nation. But now we're moving into a, this time, uh, post-Christian, where Christianity is no longer prevalent and is starting to take a backseat. So what, what are the marks what does what a post-Christian society look like? Well, I wrote some things down just to make it a, a little easier to, to see. Um, for example, post-Christian is less about morals and it's more about self. It's feelings over truth. It's what I want rather than what the Bible teaches. Um, so post-Christian West is a term that is used to describe post-Christian in the Western culture of the world. And so post-Christian West believes that the world will get better uh, with progress, with technology, with education. And the, the, the worldview right now, the philosophy of this time, is that we're going to move on from this dumb idea of God and religion, and we're actually going to get smarter. And so that's kind of where we're at. In post-Christian West, we don't need God because we ourselves can be our own God. Uh, which means we can set our own morals, we can set, uh, we can determine right versus wrong. Um, we don't have to listen to God or read his word because we can develop our own standards. That is now where we're at as a nation. It actually says we're, we're smarter than God. Yeah. Which always mystifies me. But uh, So I, I, one of the things I read is, is Pew Research reports. I, they do amazing research. One of the things they've been tracking is the percentage of adults in America who identify, self-identify as, as Christians. And in, in the last 10 years, that's actually uh, reduced by 12 percentage points. Not, not 12 percent, but 12 percentage points. Uh, that's a huge drop, just in 10 years. Um, so it, is, is this what you're talking about? Yeah, and it's really, uh, it, it's really concerning 
uh, when, when you think about that because the situation that we're in is we find that here in America, the country that was built on biblical principles is now receiving missionaries from other nations. So other countries, including Russia, the former Soviet Union, is sending missionaries to the United States. That just seems so backwards to me. As Korea is as, as well. It's becoming, the United States is now a mission field in the world. Right, and, and along those lines, Ben Reed said we're flying over the mission field to get to the mission field. And I, I support global missions. Uh, my parents were missionaries in Ecuador. I've been on mission trips to Ecuador and to Mexico. So I'm very supportive of foreign missions. But I think what Pastor Reed said some 30 years ago really is striking for us today that perhaps the greatest mission field in the world is the one we're now sitting in. So how has all this impacted the local church? Well, there's a Gallup poll that says 40% of Americans report uh, attending church on any given Sunday, but the actual attendance is closer to 20%. So 40% of the nation saying, yes, we go to church, but if we hook them up to a polygraph, it's actually more like 20%. Uh, not only that, but there are th more than 350,000 churches registered in our country, and two-thirds of the churches in America are plateaued or declining. So only a third of the churches in our country are growing right now. And of the ones that are growing, 77% are gaining their growth from uh, people who are already Christians. So in other words, we're, we're not doing a good job of reaching people with the gospel of Christ. We, we call that, pastors call that trading sheep. <laughs> right, right. And one of the things that I think that we as church leaders and really as a church have to do is we have to figure out how to better communicate. So uh, my dad still takes, he, he's not a missionary anymore, but he still takes teams to Ecuador or to Guatemala, different places like that. And, and so I've been to Ecuador a couple of times, and both times I preached there. And my dad told me the first time that I preached, he said, now I know that here in the U.S. you like to tell stories, and you like to be funny, and you like to paint a picture with words. Don't do that in Ecuador. They're, they're not going to get it. They don't get American humor. Their culture is different. And so your style of speaking won't resonate there. You just have to cut to the chase, be direct. And so I had to speak differently, and also was using a translator because I don't speak Spanish. And so that was different, you know, for somebody long-winded like me. I had to really shave things down. And so we're really at a place where I think church leaders especially have to consider that we're kind of now missionaries in our own country because we are facing some cross-cultural issues. Now, Along those lines, I, I wrote down a few things for us to think about. And the first is that the church, by post-Christian post West, considers the church homophobic, judgmental, and hypocritical. We have to be able to speak to that. Another thing about our post-Christian culture is that our personal lives are a mess. Things like anxiety, loneliness, bullying, addictions, obesity, they're all on the rise. In fact, I read that in the UK, reports are that over the last three years, the life expectancy has actually declined. So people all around us are hurting. We have the answer, that being Jesus, we have to believe that and effectively communicate it. Okay, <clears throat> so Mark, thank you for coming in and depressing us. My <laughs> pleasure. So the whole, this whole series is about hope. So let's turn a corner. Talk to us about hope. Well, the hope that we have is Jesus. I mean, he, he, may, he still makes a difference. He hasn't lost power. We may be in a post-Christian society, but, but the power of the story of Jesus still makes a difference. And so what we are doing is we're going to be uh, launching on August 15th. We're going to launch... A, uh, an online campus. So just in the same way that maybe you would start a new church, we're going to start uh, an online campus. And the purpose for that is to reach people who aren't in the building. Because here's the thing, 
recent reports, and I don't know if this was Barna, I don't, I don't know if you remember this, but, but we, re, we received a, port, a report recently that baby boomers are ready to come back to church. 70-something percent, I think. It was Barna. It was some, something like 77 percent, 80 percent, somewhere around there. But half of those are, were the other generation. So Gen, Gen X, which is my generation, the millennial generation, and then Gen Z, which is our teenagers and our kids, these generations were, are, are not ready to come back. And, and I really don't know that it has anything to do with the pandemic. I think that it has more to do with post-Christian culture. And so if people aren't ready to come back to church, we have to go and meet them where they are. So why so much emphasis on online? Well, because that's where people are living. Um, there's uh, Google Insights reports that 30,000 people every month search for the phrase church online, which means a lot of people are wanting to somehow connect with God without leaving their homes. And if you think about it, it kind of reflects the culture that we're in. There's, there's Black Friday and there's Cyber Monday. Uh, people, there are people who more and more are doing all of their Christmas shopping online, which I love that idea, actually. But you know, think about things like Uber Eats. People, I, I can pull up my phone, pull up the app, order my food. They'll bring it to me. They don't, they don't even knock on my door. I mean, they just leave it there, and my app tells me that my food's there. And so this is how people are living, and so that's, that's where we have to be. So what we're talking about is <clears throat> church online or this online campus doesn't replace this. Right. We're, you know, this is still absolutely vital, meeting in, in person. Uh, it's not one or the other. It's actually both and. Yeah, the gathered church is here to stay for sure. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. I, I put this on the screen. Church in the building reaches people for just a few hours a week. But church online can reach people potentially for 168 hours a week because the internet never closes. Right. And so the opportunities there are, are great. And, and it's more of an on-demand as well. People can access that whenever they want. Yeah, um, we actually just... see that here at our church. Um, the number of people that we have online on any given Sunday watching us is much less than what we see uh, watching our videos later in the week. So people are watching on demand more than they are live, which we, we want to get people watching live because we know that relationships are, are really important. So that's, that's what we want to move people toward. So you've been focusing on this online campus on Facebook. Why Facebook? Well, Facebook, uh, get this, three out of every four Americans are on Facebook. So 75% of our country is on Facebook. Worldwide, there are 2.7 billion people active on Facebook. That's a third of the world's population. And remember I said that, uh, that only 20% of the people are attending church in America? Well, almost 80% are on Facebook. And so that's the reason that we want to uh, focus on Facebook is because that's where people are at. Plus of all the apps, Facebook allows the most for uh, engagement and for connection and for relationships to be built. And so we feel like that's the best opportunity for us. The, the, the thing here is dying churches see the people in the pews as their target audience. And no offense, we love you guys and we're here for you. But growing churches and thriving churches see their target audience as everybody else. And so that's, that's how we have to be thinking. It's really, uh, it's a new movement of, of the Holy Spirit. I was thinking about in, in Mark, or not Mark, Acts 1-8, Jesus gives the disciples their, their, their marching orders, but it comes with a movement of the Holy Spirit. He, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. He says in Jerusalem, but for us, it's be witnesses in, in Valparaiso in Porter County, in, in the region, and to the ends of the world. And, and I see this as something akin to that. Yeah, we have the opportunity not just to reach people in our city, in our county, but also in northwest Indiana, in the U.S., and all around the world. It's, it's a powerful thing. 
Uh, think about this. There are 8 billion people in the world, only 2.3 billion are Christians. Now, he didn't ask me to do this because of my math skills, but I can tell you that's a lot of billions. It is. And I'm not, I'm not a mathematician either, but I did figure out that's only 29%. Well, that's, I, I, maybe I should have done that that's instead of just throwing up that. Yeah, maybe you should have. Yeah. <laughs> that's why you're the senior pastor. <laughs> okay. Or, I'm, I'm the guy with the calculator. <laughs> so, but so, so where, where's the hope here? Well, again, the hope is in the story of Jesus. Um, that's, that's what this all comes down to. I think that, you know, one of the things... I, I've learned a lot from Kerry Newhoff and, and another Canadian pastor named Mark Clark. And what I've learned from them is that Canada is about 10 years ahead of us in this post-Christian culture. So where we are now, they've been for 10 years. And yet they, they say pastors in Canada are still reaching a lot of people for Jesus. And so that's the hope. Because the world can try all they want to meet the needs of the people around the world and they just can't do it. But we can because we have something they don't have. We have the story of Christ, and that story still makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So as, as we wrap this up, what's, what's next steps for you? What's next steps for, for us? On August 15th, Sunday, August 15th, we're launching our, our uh, online campus uh, on Facebook. It's going to be really fun, uh, an exciting day. It's going to be the first time that Pastor Kevin will ask you to pull out your phone and log on to Facebook. And so it's going to be fun. That's going to be great. Um, yeah, it's going to be neat. And, and so we, we do need help. We're trying to build a team for, uh, for this online campus. And so if you're interested in that, please contact me and I'll do my best to answer all your questions. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Mark. I, my hope for, for the church is found in the words that, that we shared this morning, when, when we prayed, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Uh, we believe in, in the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what we're going to need, uh, I believe, to, to move forward. When we live within the power of the Holy Spirit, we notice things in our lives maybe that we didn't notice before. We, we notice where God is moving. We've seen that time and time again. During, during this series, somebody walked up to me after the previous service and said, actually, our, our hope uh, is in living out the resurrection every day. The stories of hope were resurrection stories. Uh, so, so this new online campus, it's part of our, our overall strategy. Uh, and I really believe that the Holy Spirit has moved us in this direction and, and not just moved us, but provide us, provided us with the gifts and graces of, of the people that, that we need. We can talk about better programs and more money and, and more classes and better leaders, but in the end, the solution is still in, in Jesus and, mm -hmm. and the power of, of the Holy Spirit, the power of the gospel, and that's where our hope is. Um, and so as, as we wrap this up, this, this is, it's, it's an exciting day. I hope you're excited about that. Uh, I hope we are, you appreciate what, what Pastor Mark is doing. Uh, and so can you show your appreciation for him joining us today? Uh, 